Hello everyone, Paul from Tuscan Tour Guide. Thanks for tuning in for another episode on art history. Uh, this time we're going to focus on how the, uh, the ideal beauty of a woman has evolved from Roman times to Middle Ages into the Renaissance. I hope to make it a quick video. It shouldn't be more than uh, six or seven minutes long. But before that, if you're watching this on YouTube, I please ask you to subscribe right down over here. And uh, please give me a thumbs up if you're watching on Facebook or on YouTube as well. Uh, I'd also like to remind you, if you're enjoying these videos, I encourage you to link to your PayPal account and just drop whatever you may think is appropriate uh, for this time that I'm taking to make these videos. So let's get into it. Uh, what, before we begin showing you the videos, the, the slides, I'd like, to show, I'd like to make you understand how things have changed since the Roman times to today. Uh, so in the Roman times, people had cash. They had nice, uh, luxurious items. They had jewels. Um, they had pools in their houses. They had pools in general, so they were clean people. They liked to enjoy their company. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have a pool in Sicily with the mosaic floor bottom, the bottom of the pool, which is actually a couple of women wearing bikinis. So imagine being in your pool and pe people coming over and people see you in your bikini mosaic on the bottom of your, of your pool. So it's pretty, pretty self-centered, but that's because you, they were doing well for themselves. Uh, that great time called you know, the Romans uh, living lavishly ended about in the year 500 and the Middle Ages began and nobody really was doing well for themselves. Well, I should say very few people were doing well for themselves. So what happens is people were focusing on something completely different and this is where the church took over. The church kept promising you um, the ultimate goal, which was heaven. So it doesn't really matter what you smell like or what you look like or what your skin color is like. As long as you're a good person and you, doesn't, you have no money, that's okay. You're going to go to heaven. And that's your ultimate goal in life. So there are very few portraits of any human seen in the Middle Ages. But let's get out of that time. So all the paintings there were made of Jesus, the disciples, the apostles, Gabriel, angels, and all that good stuff. Then we get out of the Middle Ages and we get into what we would call, we would consider a better time simply because people started getting some cash in their pockets. So businesses are flourishing and everybody's doing well. That's the Renaissance. But in the Renaissance, if you're doing well uh, economically, so you care about how you smell and what you look like and what your hair is looking like and what your skin color is like, well, then you want to maybe leave a remembrance of yourself. So there goes portraits for you in the Renaissance. And we have quite a few, actually a lot. Uh, not too many of women, but come to Uffizi Gallery in Florence, we have quite a few. Uh, and we're talking about 1400s and 1500s. Now, in the 1400s, things are getting rolling. In the 1500s, they blow out of control as usual. So um, we're going to focus on the difference of skin. Well, today, if we talk about skin color, you, know, you think of a, uh, of a woman having a nice skin color because they go to the beach and they get tanned and maybe long blonde hair and stuff like that, uh, or even a brunette. But long hair, well kept, doesn't people who don't stink and, and, and shower so on. So check Check out what happens when it goes from Middle Ages to Renaissance when we get into the only painting. We'll talk about eight paintings, but the first one is the only one that is really not a portrait of an actual lady who's living in Florence in the Renaissance. So check out. Here we go. This is Filippo, uh, Filippi, Filippo, nah, Filippo Lippi's Madonna and Child in the Uffizi Gallery. These are all in the four, late 14, mid to late 1400s. Um, you have the Virgin Mary, and don't forget the same old things. We have jewels, we have pearls on her head, we have white skin, that shows that she doesn't go out into the field and work and she's not a peasant. We have very elaborate dresses, and we have a very high forehead. And the forehead is the ridiculous part of this whole thing, because the higher your forehead in the Renaissance, uh, the more noble you are, simply because you want your hair, to, your hairline to begin where your crown is being placed. Uh, and your hair obviously doesn't grow that way, so it has to be plucked, so it's not very pleasant. So they're lacking vitamin D because they're not getting sun, which means they're going to have eyesight problems and they're going to have uh, birth you know, issues when, they, when they're going into labor. Uh, they're going to have lots of pain plucking their hair from their forehead. So uh, this is the first one that has nothing to do with an actual human being living in Florence in the 1400s. From here on out, then we do. This is actually a lady, we don't know exactly who she is, painted by Polaiuolo in the 1470s. Uh, but again, it's the same old concept. The hair is up and pulled back from her face. You don't want anything hiding your face or getting in your face's way. You have white skin, and they, as you know, in the, in the 1700s and 1800s in France, then they start actually powdering themselves white because they want to be whiter than white. Uh, but here we have some blushy cheeks, so you have some, some makeup going on. You have the high forehead, you have the white skin, you have the pearls. The pearls is a recurrence. All the time and the embroidered dress even though when you see this dress in the Uffizi gallery it looks like a tattoo uh, but this is these are all embroidered dresses 
And the pearls obviously are very, very rare to come by, which we're going to see in many of these different paintings. Uh, this is a detail of Maria Baroncelli. Maria Baroncelli is Italian, but this painting was painted by Hugo van der Goes up in, uh, in Bruges in the 1400s. Now, Maria here looks nothing like an Italian. Look how white her, her skin is and look how high her forehead is and the pointy nose that was actually made that way. She didn't have that kind of pointy nose. But you have still all these qualities of an ideal, beautiful woman in the Renaissance up in Bruges because Bruges is different than Florence. But it was painted uh, for a Florentine family that was up there uh, running some banks on behalf of the Medicis and this long hat here is also a Flemish thing and a Northern European thing uh, fashion wise when we're talking about the Renaissance uh, here we have another one Maria Bonciani we don't know the name of the artist who made this but we all we do know that it was made up in Bruges again uh, the interesting here is what she's holding the book saying that I'm, I, I know how to read, I'm literate, I have cash. Uh, I also have land, so I'm going to put the land in the background, but I still have a high forehead, I still have pale skin. And at this point, this is when we start getting the idea that women have no breasts. They actually put corsets on, and the corset became quite a popular thing not to be too flamboyant with your upper body. So you wanted to actually have a flat chest, and they would tie these corsets as tight as possible so you had problems breathing, and they would actually crack some of your um, some of the, um, the, rib, the ribs so that you would suffocate that way. Uh, but that was all in the name of fashion and ideal beauty. So let's continue. Uh, here we have Battista Sforza. This is in the Uffizi as well. And she's actually looking at her husband that's on the other side, which we're not going to get into because he's one of the ugliest guys in the Uffizi gallery with a broken nose and a, he's missing an eye and stuff like that. But again, we have the hair tied back. You have the pearls. You have the embroidered dress. You have all of the land that her and her husband own. You have the white skin. So it's reoccurring over and over and over. Here we have Maddalena Strozzi. Maddalena Strozzi. Uh, this, she's actually next to her husband as well in the Michelangelo room and the pearl. Now, she's a big girl. You could just tell off the bat she's a big girl. So it's difficult to hide the upper body, even though she has a corset on, because everybody has corsets on, because she's just a big, thick girl. Um, still the, the white, white skin, high forehead, hair tied back. You want nothing in the way. You have a big pearl on her neck. You have some rings on her hand. So showing power, showing uh, I have money. I don't go outside. I live a good life. The last two, this one here and the following one, uh, they actually knew each other. So this is of Lucre uh, Lucrezia Panciatichi, uh, and her husband was uh, quite a famous guy. But she's holding a book again, high forehead, white skin, corset. They have literally no chest at all. Um, here we have nothing in the background, but we have a composite column, a capital on the column here showing you that she knows architecture and she's doing well for herself. The dress is beautiful. Um, and when you get to this dress here, this dress from Bronzino, he's the one who painted this, uh, of Eleonora da Toledo. This is Cosimo the First's wife. Um, this is actually considered the first portrait of a, a ruler's wife in the world. Uh, with the heir, with the future heir, which is uh, one of her sons, uh, one of her 11 sons. But again, no chest, flat chest, I should say, pearls, High forehead, white skin, never smiling. None of the ladies ever smile. There's nothing to smile about here. This is about cash. This is about showing you what we own and what we have and how we live our lives. So it's kind of interesting to see the change of, uh, of beauty from the Middle Ages to the, to the Renaissance. But Lucrezia here, she had a bad faith because uh, the Panciatiki family, this is, this is all in the mid-1500s, they were involved in, um, in the Protestant Reformation. And unfortunately for them, uh, they got the short end of the stick because you don't join the Protestant Reformation when you're living in Rome and some of the Medici's children are popes. So uh, they, many of them got killed. So uh, you want to get into the people who have cash and you want to do well for yourselves and promote how rich you are and leave some paintings of yourself. But unfortunately... They got killed. So not a very, very good thing when you have cash and you're taking the wrong team uh, out to dinner. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. It's a quick one. Uh, there's a few more ladies actually in the Uffizi Gallery. But if we ever do a tour together, I hope to bring you there in person and show you that. So uh, I'd like to conclude again by asking you to, if you enjoyed the video, I encourage you to go to your PayPal account. Uh, if you want to subscribe, make sure when you're watching it on YouTube, make sure you click down here. And the most important thing is on June 20th at noon, there's going to be a new Zoom meeting about the Monuments Men. We're going to talk about how these uh, curators of museums, art historians from the States and uh, Britain came together 
uh, during World War II, in the middle of World War II, in 1943, from, uh, on, on behalf of Roosevelt's idea, President Roosevelt's idea, to save art throughout all of Europe. And the small team of, uh, they initially were, were two or three, and they ended up being over 300 monuments men saved over five million pieces of art and retrieved them and brought them back to the museums where they were stolen on behalf of the Nazis. So that's going to be on June 20th at noon Eastern Standard, uh, Standard Time. There's only going to be eight people allowed to join, so please email me for availability on that Zoom meeting. It'll be one hour and it'll be an awesome episode. Well, I thank you again for, for watching this episode and I hope to see you again next week on a new short one. Take care. Bye-bye.